Okay, hello everybody. My name's Jim Hunt. I'm one of the nurse educators with Insight. And before we start, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and pay our respect to elders past, present and emerging, and also to extend that respect and welcome to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders joining us today, either in the room or also out on webinar land. And today it gives me great pleasure to introduce Kate McDonald, who's very kindly agreed to come and talk to us about working with clients with personality disorders. Kate is um, a psychologist from Inner North Brisbane, uh, Metro North, and I shall now pass it over to her to uh, inform you about her so subject. Thank you. A little bit unfamiliar with the technology. Um, all right, I might actually just comment a couple on the, some of the handouts that you've got in front of you. So the handouts are largely just a copy of these slides. I've also given you a copy of what we call a diary card, which I will sort of address briefly through the presentation in terms of how we work with clients. Um, it's a bit small on the screen, so I've given you your own copies. There's also another evaluation sheet there. I think you might have two. Sorry, that's gonna be a pain. I kind of need to justify my existence. So if you wouldn't mind, if you wouldn't mind telling everyone how great I am, that would be awesome, because that will keep me employed. You can actually tell me it's crap, it's all right. Um, the other thing is that on the handouts, I noticed as I was doing a quick review that I forgot to actually put my name on the front page. So if any of you actually need to know my name or how to find me, I have addressed that up there. Can you see that? Is this print too small? The print's too small? It's Kate MacDonald with an A. Um, and in terms of my email address, it's just like the health one, so it's just kate.macdonald at the rest of it, okay? If you need to know anything more, come find me afterwards, I'll tell you. All right, now the other thing um, that's probably worth mentioning is that when I was asked to do this, you know, it's a fairly big topic and it's a, a little difficult to work out how to, to segment a part of it and then present it out of context and it still makes sense. So what I've actually done is there's way too many handouts here for me to actually talk to in an hour. So what I'm going to do is just briefly allude to a few things just to actually provide a bit of context. And then I'm going to try and target it in a little bit more specifically about uh, what we do with clients with comorbid borderline personality disorder with the suicidal and self-harming behaviours who also have a substance abuse disorder. So we'll talk a little bit more specifically about that, but I just thought I'd address the rest of what we do just to provide a little bit of context. Um, so if I rush through a couple of things, that's why I'm doing that, okay. I can still ask quest answer questions, I don't mind getting distracted, but just being conscious of time, that's all. All right, hmm, that didn't work, that did. All right, so when we're looking at um, talking about the, the etiology, if you like, of borderline personality disorder, each school of therapy has its own way of formulating things. So if you talk to a cognitive behavioural therapist or a psychodynamic therapist or someone who practices from dialectical behaviour therapy, you're going to get different uh, formulations. The only therapy that actually has level one evidence in the treatment of borderline personality disorder with the self-harming behaviours is dialectical behaviour therapy because that's the one with the level one evidence, that's the one that we use and so that's how we formulate. So when I'm talking about the etiology of the disorder, I'm doing it from that perspective. You'll get a different, you might get a different formulation if you talk to a therapist with a different background. Uh, so the, the developmental, excuse me, break there. The theory that's associated with the development of borderline personality disorder is called the biosocial developmental theory. Now, the, the woman who created borderline, person, uh, borderline personality disorder, dialectical behaviour therapy, is a woman by the name of Marsha Linehan. So she's a psychiatrist uh, who works out of uh, Seattle in the States and is affiliated with the University of Washington there. So this is her theory. So her theory is that, so the biopsychosocial, so the bio part of it is Look, effectively it's nature or it's temperament. So, um, I don't know if 
you guys know very much about kids, but you like when babies from the second they get born, they've actually got very different little natures. You know, you get the sort of fairly robust ones who, you know, feed really easily and attach really easily and settle really easily. And then you get the other ones like mine, <laughs> that you end up pacing up and down hallways at three o'clock in the morning, right? So, what they, so the, the, the theory is that at a biological level, uh, when they get distressed, their autonomic nervous system kicks off and it actually does shoot higher than other people's and then you've got that slow return to baseline. So that's actually at a biological level. Now, if that's all that ever happens, that's actually not a big deal, right? These, these kids tend to grow up um, you know, being the really sensitive, caring, wonderful people of the world. So by itself, this isn't an issue. There's another author whose name temporarily escapes me. He refers to orchid kids. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? No. Anyway, um, the, the idea of an orchid kid is that they're really, really hard to raise, but if you get it right, they're beautiful. Right. So by itself, the biological component isn't an issue. can't remember the name of the guy who actually he wrote a book on it. Anyway. So the biological part by itself isn't a huge issue. What tends to happen, however, is that if you take one of these biologically sensitive little ones and you put them in a socially invalidating environment during their developmental years, that transaction tends to be where the issues <coughs> come. Now, definition of a socially invalidating environment is many and varied. All right? At its core level, it's child's needs not met. Now, whether that's not met because of the whole spectrum of abuse or neglect or hypercritical parenting or all that spectrum, or whether it's, you know, you've got parents working 60 hours a week to try and keep food on the table, you know, and it's just that, you know, when they get home, they're tired. And so the kids don't want to add to their burden by bringing problems to them, so they don't, right? So it means they've got no one to actually take stuff to. It can be that. It can be bullying at school. It can be a whole range of different things. So, you know, when I'm talking to clients about this model, you know, whilst there are certainly going to be times when, you know, you could clearly blame the parent and want to stab them in the eye with a fork, it's not always the case, all right? Sometimes it's got nothing to do with the parents. They can be very loving, warm families. It doesn't have to be that way. For whatever reason, what tends to happen is, so you've got this biologically sensitive little one who's been placed in this socially invalidating environment. And the result of that is that they have a tendency not to develop certain skill sets, okay? So, when, you know, when, when kids are, you know, going through those developmental years, you know how, particularly when they're little, you know, around the two, three year olds, you know, the temper tantrums and stuff, yeah? Right, there's some direct teaching involved from parents in terms of, all right, well, you can't be doing that, so here are some other strategies, or get sent to their room, or parents can reinforce it by giving in. Like, there's a whole range of things that can happen around that area. Um, there's also modeling, so the kids actually see how their parents respond to distress. So if parents start slamming things and throwing things around, versus calmly going, hmm, okay, well, that didn't work. Let's see what else we can do. Right, so there's modeling. Um, and then as they get older, it's, it's whether or not the kids actually come to them with actual problems, so they get assistance in problem solving, right? So this is how skill develops, right? Um, and in these socially invalidating environments, for whatever reason, what tends to happen is that that stuff doesn't tend to happen, or it doesn't happen particularly well or it happens in some areas, but not in other areas. So what happens then is these kids reach adulthood with skills deficits in certain areas. And the areas that they tend to um, have skills deficits in are the emotion regulation skill set, so the ability to keep yourself in a bit of a stable emotional container. And pretty much no matter what happens, you kind of have this stability of emotional reactivity to actually manage the environment. Uh, distress tolerance skills, which is, okay, the emotions are going to escape the container at some point in time, they always do. Now, how do you manage that? Um, interpersonal effectiveness, so how do you interact with the world in a way that gets your own needs met but doesn't necessarily stomp on the needs of other people? Uh, and sort of an awareness of self and uh, an experience of the self as being more or less okay. 
Um, so that's kind of your mindfulness set. So those are the areas of skill deficits that these, that these kids kind of hit young adulthood with, and they've got deficits in those areas. They're not stupid, however. They look at all the other adults their age and go, okay, well, everybody else seems to be able to do this stuff. So they start giving it a go, but they've got skill deficits. They actually don't know how to do it. So then they fail. Right? And then you start getting this learned helplessness. Right? And it all goes kind of pear-shaped from there. And that's pretty much how you wind up with borderline personality disorder. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. In terms of how it manifests, is anyone actually familiar with dialectical behaviour therapy? Okay, all right. Do you know the red and black textbook? Okay, chapter three in the red and black textbook is this. So what this is, is all right, so that's how the disorder develops. How does it manifest? What does it look like? All right. <clears throat> I've turned this into a one page slide. This is actually an entire chapter. So it's much edited. If people actually want more information about this, go find the red and black textbook, chapter three. Uh, the other thing is, these are, these are polls. So people can bounce between the polls. And the idea is to kind of, in terms of treatment, is to try and help people find a bit of synthesis between those things. So they, they bounce. So emotional vulnerability is where that, you've got that high emotional arousal which interferes with other behavioural responses. So who problem solves really well when they're really distressed? Okay, no one. Yeah. Right. This population is really distressed a lot. So even if they've got certain skill sets, they don't tend to be able to access them quite a lot of the time because they're always really distressed. Um, and the other thing with that is that there's an awareness of that. So there's an awareness that sometimes they've got skills and sometimes they don't. So there's this sense of unpredictability about their own um, control of being skillful. So even sometimes when clients are actually doing reasonably well for a period of time, they can still react um, quite badly to any idea that you're going to have higher expectations of them. Because even if they feel okay in this minute, and even if they think that they could do it in this five second space, they're not sure that they'll feel that way tomorrow. And they know that if they feel really distressed tomorrow, all those skills might as well not exist for them. So there's this sense of unpredictability. Self-invalidation is the adoption by the individual of the characteristics of the invalidating environment. I had a client once, I gave, you know those, you know I play golf, you know those golf clickers? Right, it measures putts and drives, right? You can actually get up to 99 on the thing. So I, had a, I gave this to a client once and got her to, to click it every time she, had a, she was consciously aware of a self-invalidating thought. So she, she would roll the thing three times a day. Right, so she had 300 self-invalidating statements that was going through her head every day. And these were just the ones that she was aware of. I would bet anything you like that there was double that floating around subconsciously in the back of her head. You know, so you're worthless, you're evil, you don't deserve to breathe, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Right, so as a bit of a rote in your head, that's fairly distracting. Yeah. Active passivity, this tends to be one of the ones that drives therapists nuts. All right, so that's the tendency for an individual to approach problems passively and hopelessly um, and demand from the environment solutions to problems. So they're very active in trying to get everybody else to do everything and very passive in trying to do it themselves. People familiar with that? Oh, it tends to be the one that drives people insane the most. Okay, so what that is about is if you, you know if you're remembering the the whole concept of a skill development and that's where you're approaching it from. This client group ha often has a history of failure, so they have this belief system that if they try and give it a go themselves, it actually won't work. They'll fail and probably make the situation worse. And they've usually got a decent level of evidence for that. Right? That's often they've been their experience. It's also, you know, borderline personality disorder, it's a very polarised disorder, right? So the cognitions tend to be very black and white, good or bad. Right? So what they have a tendency to do is to look at clinicians and go, right, well, you appear reasonably well put together, you're not in a corner crying and rocking, 
you're at work, you're employed, so clearly you've got it all together. So you've got all the answers to all the life's problems and I have nothing. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. But that's, that, you know, that's how people look at it. So if you've got a belief system that this is a really important thing that needs to be done, if I do it, it's going to fail. If you do it, it's going to work and it's going to be easy and this person isn't doing it, then what's the response going to be? Right. So that they have then have a tendency to start demonising staff. Right, because clearly you can do it if you wanted to. So you're being mean and you're being unhelpful and you're being all these horrible things, right? So it's it's more about um, learned helplessness than it is about laziness or anything like that. Right. It tends to be what that's about. Do I want to say anything else about that? Hmm. Apparent competence. Um, apparent competence, I actually see a bit more in my private practice. I don't see it quite so much in the public system, although a little bit. So that's the tendency for individuals to appear competent and able to cope, but then to behave as though those competencies didn't exist. So you'll find clients who, either they've grown up in a family where expressions of emotion were not viewed well, so they've tended to learn to mask and hide emotions, so they can be sitting in front of you really, really distressed. You see absolutely none of that on their faces and you've got no indication of it. So you think the session's gone really well and they walk out the door and 10 minutes later you've got the hospital on the phone going, oh, your client's up here in peck. Not that kind of thing. Um, the other thing is um, the tendency for people to intellectualise. So there is, a, there is a subsection of the population that's very good at telling you what skill would be a good one to use and telling you what the acronym is and even being able to give you a good example of what that would look like. And then the second they're distressed, they got nothing. Right? There's absolutely no evidence that they used that skill or even thought of that skill. Right? This is apparent competence. They've got it at an intellectual superficial level, but the second they're distressed, they have absolutely zero ability to actually use it. Right? So they look like they've got it, they don't. That can be quite tricky to work with. Unrelenting crisis is, is one of the other ones that tends to be difficult for therapists. And like in, in years before DBT, um, I remember um, people talking about the, you know, the reactive approach that caused a lot of frustration in working with this population, that a client would come in, they'd be in crisis about something or other, you'd spend the entire session dealing with the crisis the client would be relatively settled when they left and then a week later they'd come back in with a different crisis and you actually never had any opportunity to provide any therapy that would actually stop the crises from happening. Right? So they just tend to bounce from crisis to crisis to crisis. Um, <clears throat> so what you've got there is, so if you're remembering that um, <clears throat> high autonomic nervous system escalation and the slow return to baseline, what tends to happen is Sorry, I usually use a whiteboard at this point, there's one. Um, picture a graph. So, you know, most people's, their distress levels, you know, they go up a bit and they bounce around a bit through life and you have peaks and troughs. The, the borderline client, when they have a distressing moment, their, escal their autonomic nervous system escalates really high and it takes a very long time to calm down. So if a person without this disorder is having another crisis you know, a couple of weeks later, everything's been back at baseline for ages, the borderline client might not be back at baseline yet. So they have a tendency to shoot from an already elevated position, all right, which is what the unrelenting crisis is about. The other thing is because, um, because they've got skills deficits in the first place, um, they do have a tendency to actually have more crises than other people. So, you know, we had a phone bill that gets blown out of the mailbox or something rather, we don't see it, we don't pay it and suddenly we get a disconnection notice, you know, we're going to ring up and go, oh, sorry about that, and either pay the bill or arrange a repayment plan or something. This client, because they're high levels of distress about it and they're poor into personal skills, are likely to yell at the person <coughs> on the other end of the phone and get their phone cut off. Right? So they have more crises. Right? So that kind of tends to be what the unrelenting crisis is all about. Can people picturing clients when I'm talking? Yeah. All right. The other one, um, the last one, the inhibited grieving. This is actually getting a little bit more of a hit in the research at the moment, actually. 
So this is avoidance or inhibition of the experience of grieving. So it's a little bit sad phobic and it can generalize a little bit as well. So what happens there is that clients are so terrified of the emotion of sad. Right? Sad tends to be human beings, generally speaking, the least favorite emotion, right? Because sad is a, it's a very passive emotion. It's just a bit of a blah emotion. There's usually not very much you can do about sad. Sad, sad tends to be an emotion that's experienced when there isn't much you can do about a situation whether or not someone has died or whether a relationship has broken up or whether a friend has been mean to you or whatever it is. It tends to be something that you can't really do very much about. So it's not perceived of as a particularly comfortable emotion. Um, for this client group, of course, SAD becomes very acute, right? It becomes very distressing. It becomes intolerable. So a little tiny bit of SAD creeps in and they have a tendency to block it very, very quickly. Blocking looks like a variety of different things. The, the favorite of masking emotion of sad is anger. If you've got a client who's very angry all the time, particularly if the anger doesn't always make a lot of sense, go looking for sad. Um, that's often what's behind it. And the reason that anger is the favorite masking emotion is that it's perceived of and experienced as a more powerful emotion. So, it's, it's, it comes with autonomic nervous system arousal, not sedation. So you get, it feels more powerful, it feels more energetic. Um, it often comes with a plan of some description. It's usually a bad plan, it's usually a vengeance plan, right? But it's a plan nonetheless, you know? It's like, that, that's really sad that I've lost a friend, becomes I'm gonna show them I'm gonna slash their tires. Okay, so <clears throat> it's not a good plan, but it's a plan, right? So it's experienced as more active and purposeful. Um, so that tends to happen a bit. The other thing that happens with inhibited grieving is again this masking. So the client who has no idea what emotions are, right? they don't actually experience any of them or they experience them broadly in good and bad emotions, but they can't actually distinguish between sad, distressed, angry, guilty, ashamed. They can't experience between the different emotions. So because they block it, they don't actually look at it long enough to actually determine what's what. Um, so that can happen. The other thing is, of course, that self-harm can happen in that context because that's the greatest way to actually block emotion. So feel sad, self-harm, sad is gone. That's the other time that can happen. And that leads to disassociation as so. well. Yep. Yeah, I mean, dissociation is pretty much any of the emotions that are really extreme and the brain just takes a bit of a break. And of course, you can get complete dissociation where people kind of almost look a bit like they're having a petty mal seizure, like they just kind of, they're talking and they just stop and stare. Um, and then you get people who are still operating and they talk to you about it the next day and they have no recollection of having seen you. Their brains just weren't there that kind of thing. All right, so what I've got here is um, on the left-hand side, we've got the DSM-5 criteria, and then on the right-hand side there, we've just got how uh, DBT reconceptualizes it. So the marked reactivity of mood and the intense inappropriate anger, um, we conceptualize as emotional dysregulation. There are current suicidal behaviour, gestures, threats, and the other impulsive behaviours, behavioural dysregulation. The chaotic relationships and the frantic efforts is interpersonal dysregulation. Identity disturbance, uh, unstable self-image or sense of self, self-dysregulation, as is the chronic feelings of emptiness. And the uh, transient stress-related paranoid ideation or severe dissociative symptoms is your cognitive dysregulation. Why is that important? because that's how we design skills around it. So we take those systems of dysregulation and there are modules of skill remediation, basically. If you're looking at it as, a, as the disorder as a skill, a disorder of skill deficits, then the treatment is skill remediation. That's basically what we do with it, which I'll talk about a little bit more. All right, so that's the disorder. So I'm gonna move on very briefly to the the therapy itself. Does anyone actually have any questions before I move on about anything I've said thus far? 
So I'm saying making sense. Awesome. Okay, so as I said before, um, Marsha Linehan is the lady who developed this disorder. Involved from three main components being CBT, Buddhism and dialectics. We'll talk about what dialectics are in a sec. Um, interesting, like she was, she was raised a Catholic and she's still a, a practicing Catholic. She's quite open about this when she talks. But she's also a Buddhist master, so she's actually gone through all of those levels. Um, so she's quite knowledgeable about that area as well and quite good therefore at blending stuff. The two inseparable strands, so we've got the theory of borderline personality disorder, which of course um, instructs the treatment. So what's dialectics? <clears throat> what is dialectics? Okay, so dialectics, the definition is it's about the synthesis of polarities in, in brief. So what that's about is, so you've got, for example, your, your black, white, gray scale. So black and white being your poles and gray being your middle ground. DBT, you know, there, there is an element of grayness about things, but the other part of it is that they talk about polka dots or plaid, which is to say black and white existing with equal truth in the same moment at the same space, mutually opposing views. So that's things like, um, Let's say got a contentious topic of some description, a political opinion or a religious opinion of some description. If you can actually hold your own opinion and be clear about the rationale for your opinion and listen to somebody else's opinion and how they, ha how they come to have that opinion and see the truth and value in the other person's opinion and see how they got there, while simultaneously maintaining your own view. That's, that's an example of dialectics. All right. So you can see the truth uh, and, the and the validity and the value in mutually opposing views in the same space. So what clients with this population struggle with is this concept of right and wrong. So if you're right, that means I must be wrong. So they're not very good at, okay, well, that's your opinion and you're entitled to that, but that doesn't mean I need to share it and doesn't mean, mean that I need to live my life in accordance with it. So they're not awesome at that. So dialectics is about that. It's being able to hold things apart and together at the same time. I'm trying to think of another example. Um, <clears throat> sometimes with clients, you know, you can get that um, transgenerational pattern occurring. And so they can talk about the things that their family might have done that you know they found really invalidating at the time and were sort of causal if you like to the development of the disorder but they can also see that um, they didn't mean that or they didn't intend that or they were really really busy so then what happens is they feel really guilty about blaming them what Smart has got this saying about all behaviour is caused, which is to say, okay, so the way you are at the moment, that behaviour has been caused, but the way your parents parented, that behaviour was also caused. So it means that you can actually look at causality without blame in the same space. So that's an example of dialectics. All right, you can say, yes, I came to this place because of deficits in parenting, but that wasn't mum and dad's fault. You know, they loved me, they tried their best, they had their own skills deficits or they had their own environmental factors at play. I don't need to be mad at them or angry at them. And I also don't need to be mad and angry at myself because this is what happened and this is how it came to be. Does that, does that make sense? All right, so that's dialectics. I'm pretty sure I just said that. Yeah, so the key dialectic is acceptance on the one hand and change on the other, which I'll talk about in a minute. So in terms of the phases of treatment from DBT, we, there's a pre-commitment phase, which is I don't know, anywhere between sort of four and eight sessions, depending on the client and the time. Um, and the main, the main goal of the pre-commitment phase is actually obtaining commitment from the client. So you, know, you orient them to the therapy so they know what it is that they're in for look at building a therapeutic relationship, get the commitment from the client, um, work out what your targets are going to be, and move on. 
those are all the commitment strategies. I'm not going to go into those particularly. Then they active, and then they enter active therapy. So in in active in a in an adherent DBT program, there I've got five there, but there are four main components. So there's skills group, individual therapy, phone coaching, and consult group. So there are lots of programs around and lots of people around who talk about doing DBT. If it's if all four of those elements are not in the treatment they're offering, it is not adherent DBT. That doesn't always matter. It depends on the client and what the client's needs are. If they're self-harming, they've got suicidal ideation, the evidence is that you need a fully adherent program. But you do get clients who are just really chaotic and make bad choices and don't have great interpersonal skills, but they don't actually self-harm. In which case, a skills group, there's evidence that a skills group can actually be helpful for that population. So it just depends on which population you're treating and what the evidence is about the therapy broken down. But if they're self-harming, you need an adherent program. That's what the evidence is. So the way that skills groups works, do I talk about that? Oh, yes, I do. Um, so it's a structured skills training. It consists of two and a half hours a week with two therapists, uh, and all the skills are taught. Clients have to come to both individual and skills training two main components to it, so there's usually a homework review and then there's new skills that are taught. Um, maximum nine participants, Marsha used to say eight, she now says nine. At the Valley we keep it at eight, we just find nine a bit unmanageable by the time you review everybody's homeworks and diary cards, it just gets too long. There are four modules. The way it works though is core mindfulness actually takes up the first two sessions of each of the other three modules. So emotion regulation addresses labile moods and high emotionality, distress tolerance, um, looks at impulsivity, because if you're really, really distressed, you don't have any skills, you tend to do impulsive things. Uh, interpersonal effectiveness, obviously addresses the interpersonal chaos. So this, there are three modules between seven to nine weeks each, depending on which module it is, but the first two weeks are mindfulness. So it takes about 24 weeks to go through the first six months, which is your skill acquisition phase. So if you're conceptualising, you know, you've got a puzzle box and every time you come into session someone gives you a piece of the puzzle. So at the end of six months you've got all the bits of the puzzle but they're just kind of rattling around, there's no shape to them. So the second six months is about putting all the puzzle pieces together to create an adherent picture, you know. So what that's about is that, you know, there's a difference between me being able to say, like there's an interpersonal skill called Dear Man, you know, write, write me up a dear man and the client being able to do that and a client on their own being able to go, okay, there's an interpersonal difficult situation here. I'm distressed. I know that I'm not very effective when I'm distressed. I need to use some, I need to use some distress tolerance skills right now to calm down. Then I need to go and script a dear man. Then I need to de deliver it. It may or may not go well. If it doesn't go well, how am I, what's my part? That, that's, that's a different set of skills. So that's the second six months. It's about how to pull skills from all over the place and actually mesh it to what the circumstance in the moment is and be able to use that combination skillfully. The other thing that the second six months is about when you're talking about generalisation is that sometimes clients can use, actually it's probably not just clients, I think all of us are a bit like this, um, are very good at using a certain set of skills in one context, not necessarily in a different context. So usually it's better at work than at home. It's not always the case, but it's often the case. So at work, less emotionally attached to their colleagues than they are to their families. Um, there are higher consequences for losing it at work than there are for losing it at home. So you can pull it together at work. People can be assertive. They can problem solve really well in a work context. They can appear relatively competent. And then they go home and it falls apart completely. So the second six months is also about, okay, so you've got these skills that you can use here. How do you generalise that to here? So it's about being able to use all skills in all relevant contexts. So that's what, another thing about what the second six months is about. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's why we repeat it even though it's exactly the same thing. There is a reason. They also tend to be highly anxious in the first little while, so often they don't actually process it the first time around anyway. 
All right, so individual therapy. So the individual therapist is responsible for helping the client to inhibit the maladaptive behaviours and replace them with skillful responses. Um, we do this by um, coaching the clients through skill usage. Um, we look at motivational issues, various environmental factors, look at reinforcers, that kind of thing. I'm going to talk about the diary cards in a second. Uh, on the diary cards, we actually track certain specific behaviours that the client has identified that they'd like to work on. The first one is always self-harm or suicidal behaviours. So at the Valley, um, we have, uh, they've got to have a minimum of two self-harm episodes in the previous six months to actually be eligible for the program, which is a relatively high standard, but with that standard, we've got two programs and they're both full and we've got a 12-month waiting list. So. We do the best we can with what we've got. Um, decreasing, so that all of the suicidal behaviours come first. Decreasing therapy of interfering behaviours comes next. So therapy interfering behaviours is anything that actually gets in the way of the client receiving good therapy. If they don't show up, for example, they're not in front of you, you can't treat them. That interferes with therapy. Not doing their homework, not doing their diary cards, presenting intoxicated, um, being non-participatory, so sitting there and glaring at you with your arms crossed or yawning and staring at the ceiling or giving you, I don't know, I don't know, I don't remember, all of that, okay, all of that's therapy interfering behaviours. So in DBT we actually address that directly, it's like, mm, okay, some therapy interfering behaviour going on, let's look at that. We'll do a chain analysis on what led to this therapy interfering behaviour, so it's dealt with very directly. And the third one, which is the one that clients actually want to talk about, is the quality of life interfering behaviours. So that's, you know, the fight they just had with mum or their boyfriend or the fact that their car just got repossessed or they're about to be evicted. Right? So that's what the clients want to talk about. That's actually number three. And these are hierarchical. So if there's been a self-harm episode, that's what, that's what gets the tick. That's the topic of conversation, regardless of whether or not there are other lower target behaviours. It doesn't mean you don't necessarily get to them at all. It depends upon how long it takes, but you have to move down it in a hierarchy and of course increasing the behavioural skills. Alright, so diary cards are used to set the agenda for individual therapy. So I've put, I've given you all copies of diary cards there, just because this could be a little bit small. So the way a diary card works is in the first kind of, th oh, all right, the, first co the first column there is the day, ignoring that one. The next three are about how strong people's particular urges are. Then you've got some emotional experiencing. Then the last sort of five columns are about what they've actually done. So, you know, you might have had a really strong urge to self-harm, but then you used a whole bunch of skills and you didn't actually do it, for example. So how strong was your urge? What did you actually do? And what you put in those columns depends very much upon what the client wants to work with. So suicidality and self-harm is always there because that's the point of the program. But the rest of it depends on what the clients do. So if they have a substance abuse disorder as well, or even if it's not, I don't, know, I don't know what the threshold is for disorder, but if they're doing any sorts of substances and it's interfering with their quality of life in any way, shape or form, that can get a tick, right? So that can be in a column. Um, all of the other impulsive behaviours, so shoplifting, gambling, um, speeding in a car, um, unsafe sex, all, all of those impulsive behaviours. So if they're doing any of that, that can go in. If they um, have anger issues and they've screamed at mum or the boyfriend or whatever, that can go in. Um, a couple of girls I'm working with my private practice at the moment, multiple texting is there. You know, so they're feeling a bit insecure, so they text the boyfriend 500,000 times and lo and behold they get dumped. Yep. Multiple texting can go in. All right, so whatever it is that they're doing that's interfering with their quality of life and they want to be not doing that, that's what goes in. Um, if there are more than there are columns, you can either muck around with the card and increase more columns if you can find the space on the page, uh, or you can prioritise. doesn't really matter. And the middle bits are emotions. <clears throat> uh, in my private practice, we've actually expanded that a little bit and we include um, guilt as a separate emotion for shame, 
Uh, oh no, that's it there. Anyway, we include a bunch more. I think there's only one happy one there, Joy. I think we've got a few more happy ones. Pride, I think we've got as one of them, and gratitude is another. Um, Marsha herself isn't too perturbed about the emotions. The, the important parts for her are the urges and the actions, and that's what you use to set your agenda for your individual therapy session. So if there's been any suicide attempt or any self-harm, it gets recorded on the diary card. You look at that, you see it, that's what gets the topic of conversation today. Then you kind of go down your priority list in terms of other things. If they've missed three sessions and they've just rocked up for the fourth, then therapy interfering behaviour is going to get a hit prior to substance use or fight with mum. So this part of the diary card, this is the part that only gets, this gets shared with the individual therapist only. So this is private between your client and the therapist. The back of it is a list of all of the compulsory skills. Now, I'll talk about the non-compulsory ones in a sec. So this part gets shared with the, um, with the skills group. So this is just about what skills did you use? What skills did you use? What did you work on this week? What did you find helpful? What are you going to work on next week? What got in the way of you using that particular skill? So this part gets shared. Uh, and the little code at the side there is about the degree of how effective they were for you. What is not on here, which I thought about afterwards, is because in DBT there's like there's so many skills, um, and the ones that are compulsory have got a star on them, and the ones that aren't don't. So in our skills group, we do all of the compulsory ones. And then if you've got clients that have got particular issues, you can pull from the um, non-compulsory ones. Or if you've got a group that just by fluke, everyone in there happens to have a substance abuse disorder, you can pull up those skills as well. But the substance abuse disorders are actually not compulsory skills, which is why they're not on this card. Um, in my private practice, we have a third page, which actually includes the substance abuse problems, and I'm toying with doing that in the, pro in the public one as well. I'm thinking about that. Um, or at the bottom there, we've got other skills. You can add them there if you like. All right, so this is monitoring their skill usage. In individual therapy, um, you know, there's a very structured, um, how it goes. So you start off with mindfulness practice, that is optional. You look at the diary card, that has to be the first thing you do because that's how you set the agenda. You set the agenda in terms of your hierarchy of targets. Chain analysis is a particular skill that, um, technique that we use to actually look at target behaviour. So that's about how did this happen? Right, we ended up with this particular target behaviour occurring. How did that happen? Um, clients tend to be very bad at cause and effect and links. You know, I get lots of, I don't know, I was fine one minute, the next minute I was self-harming. You know, I get a little bit of that. Um, or I got really distressed, I've got no idea where that came from. And so until you start talking about it, that, well, you know, you just, you watched a television program about sexual abuse half an hour earlier, do you think that actually had anything to do with it? Oh, maybe. Right, they're actually bad at that. Right? They're actually not great at cause and effect. So the chain analysis is actually about connecting the dots for them, and also about finding spots where they could have intervened. Right? And that's where you weave in your solution analysis, which, um, because the individual therapists and the, um, the um, skills trainers all meet regularly, you know, what, you know where your client is in the program, what skills they have or haven't been taught, and then you can use those. Well, I know you got taught this last week, so do you reckon you could have used that at this point? So you do that with that. Phone coaching um, has got a couple of different purposes. The, the main one is actually about skill, skill generalisation. So, you know, as we've already talked about, the second someone is really distressed, they're actually not very great, and this is everybody, at problem solving or using skills. Right? No one's great at that when they're really distressed. So, and people don't get distressed convenience, conveniently during your one hour a week therapy session or even during business hours. So, phone coaching is theoretically 24 hours. Um, in reality, it can be a little different to that. So, you know, we've got, do you guys do the 1300MH call number? Yeah, okay. Am I allowed to say something bad about that? I probably can't on this <laughs> forum, can I? All right. 
Okay, because what that means is that calls get <coughs> bounced around the system, anyone can answer the phone. Now at the Royal, I've got reasonable access to our um, extended hours, our acute care team and our PEC staff, so I can do training with them on how to do phone coaching. I can't do that with every hospital that they're likely to get bounced to. So it means they get a variable response. Um, we're working on that. All right. So theoretically it's 24 hours. In reality, the effectiveness of that, who knows. Um, in in BTEC, which is Marsha's company, all the individual therapists have mobile phones and their clients have their personal mobile phone numbers and they're allowed to ring whenever. And it's the natural limits of the therapist. So in my private practice, I don't do phone coaching personally, um, but that's, it, it's partially because I have a three day a week gig in government and you're not really supposed to take private practice calls during your government time. And at home I have a small child who would be likely to want to talk to them. Uh, and that wouldn't work very well for anybody. So one of my colleagues does my phone coaching for me. Um, usually they turn their phones off at about 10 o'clock at night or whatever and they tell the clients that. If the clients know they've got something coming, they can negotiate with whoever their phone coach is to leave their phone on just in case they need to call them. Uh, and we do actually encourage that so, um, so they can be distressed and coach through effective skill usage in the moment of distress without then engaging in target behaviours. So that's what phone coaching is about. And it's considered therapy interfering behaviours for clients to self-harm without having utilised phone coaching. They're supposed to ring you when they have that urge. Consult group. So this is basically your DBT team meeting. So the main point there is about therapy adherence. Um, therapist drift is a fairly high risk. Originally consult group was actually, um, it was about therapy adherence in a research context. So it was about you know ensuring that the therapy that was being researched was being delivered as it was described and intended to be delivered. And that's what the consult group was about. So when the research, the original research ended, so did consult group. And what they found was that all of their outcomes started to drop off. So the results that they were getting weren't as great when consult group wasn't there. And so when they had a look at that, it was about therapist drift. So the therapists were no longer being quite as, as hard as they need to be. They, they weren't always checking diary cards or they were letting it slide if there were a few days there that hadn't done or they weren't doing a missing links on someone who hadn't done homework or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, the outcomes dropped off. So now they've, so they put consult group back and it's now considered one of the four components. Um, so I, I was listening to uh, Marsha speak a few years ago and she was, she was very definite about if you are not attending consult group, you are not doing DBT. So she considers it uh, an essential part of delivering adherent treatment. So the treatment itself has got, as I said, four modules, being the personal effectiveness, emotion regulation, distress tolerance and mindfulness. Interpersonal effectiveness and emotion regulation are your change modules. Distress tolerance and mindfulness are more your acceptance modules. So by acceptance, we kind of mean, all right, so right here, right now, the situation is as it is, and there's nothing you can really do to change it in this second, but you really don't want to make it worse. So what skills can you use to manage your level of distress in this moment without making it worse, given that you can't really fix the problem? All right, so that's, that's kind of what that's about. All right? You're unemployed, you're unemployed. You can't click your fingers and get a job. <coughs> How are you going to manage that until such time as you can get a job? Right. The change strategies <coughs> are more about, so what can you do to live your life more effectively? So the degree of distressing things doesn't actually happen as much. All right, so how can you um, communicate more effectively with the world? How can you keep your own emotions in a bit of a container so you're less likely to misinterpret or overreact to things that then, then creates more problems. How can you actually manage that more effectively? So that's more change. The change modules are way harder than the acceptance modules. Um, and because they require a higher level of skill, pretty hard to do it when someone is actually distressed. So you tend to use the distress tolerance stuff first to calm down. 
then swap to the change strategies. So the change modules are, as I said, motion regulation and interpersonal effectiveness. Now I'm just going to rush through these and just give you some names. Really? Okay. Um, as I was saying earlier, clients can actually not be awesome at distinguishing different emotions. So there's a whole skill on here's the name of emotion, here's what it feels like, here's what it looks like, here are the kind of cognitions that go with it, here are the kind of body changes that people might experience, um, here are the kind of urges, action urges that people are likely to experience, and like details all of that stuff out for like about 10 different emotions. Um, then there's a set on changing the emotional responses. So you actually have to know what the emotion is first, hence the previous skill. Checking the facts is about um, the, what's the emotion that you want to change. So it's not actually the facts of the situation, kind of, but you start with what emotion do you want to change. And then it's like, okay, well, what actually happened? Who actually said what? Don't give me the interpretation at this point. I want the actual words that we use. Now give me your interpretation. Are you assuming a threat? Is there another way of interpreting that? Right, skill. And then you work out whether or not the, the emotion itself is either, uh, you're like it fits the facts of the situation or it doesn't. If it does, then you probably need to do some problem solving. If it doesn't, then you probably need to do some emotion, opposite emotion action. So there are other skills that branch off from that. Vulnerability factors, we'll look at those. A whole bunch of other skills. Interpersonal effectiveness. <clears throat> So the first one there, which is about clari um, clarifying priorities, is in any situation, you know, you've got three sorts of different things that you're after. So what's more important? Achieving the goal, so the objective, maintaining a relationship with the other person, or your self-respect. Now, it's not, it's rarely that any one of those three is completely irrelevant, but the relative importance tends to change with them. So firstly, work that out because you're not going to actually get anything that you want if you're not clear on what that is. If, you, if the objective is the most important thing, the skill is the dear man, give goes with relationship, fast goes with self-respect, and there's also an intensity issue. So again, you know, with borderline personality disorder sort of being a fairly polarised disorder, you, know, you tend to have this um, don't ask, they should know what I want, they should just do it without me even saying because it's obvious or have a complete temper tantrum about it, insist demand, stamp your foot, and not a lot in between. So this skill is about intensity of asking. So it's about how do you, how do you pitch it at the right level of intensity, and how do you step it up or step it down, and how do you work out how to do that. That's what that one's about. It's one of my favorite skills, actually. I like that one. Building relationships, ending destructive ones, walking the middle path, Acceptance modules, mindfulness, being conscious of time. I'm not going to do very much on this. Does anyone particularly want me to talk a lot about mindfulness? No? Cool. I'll just skip all of that. And we'll go back to this though. All right, so <clears throat> with your crisis survival, with, so this is the distress tolerance module now. You've got the first set, which is your crisis survival skill. So this is the stuff when you're really distressed at, and how do you actually not make the situation worse. Um, won't necessarily go into that either a lot just because of time. The second set of distress tolerance skills are those. These ones are the ones that I thought you might be a bit more interested in is when the crisis is an addiction. Right, so these, these are the actual skills that we use to work with addictions. So remembering that these are recorded on your diary card as target behaviours if the client wants to work on them. Um, obviously clients can lie, but I, they don't really tend to particularly, I have to say. I mean, sometimes you find out about things after the event, but by and large, you know, they're in therapy for a reason, they could just not be here. So record it, and these are the skills that we use. So this concept of dialectical abstinence is an interesting one. All right, this is actually an interesting one. So, all right, so my, my understanding, and you guys probably know more about this than I do, 
is there's two sort of broad ways of treating substances. So you've got your abstinence model and then you've got your harm reduction model. All right. So the issue with the abstinence is that there's a tendency for people, if they fall off the wagon briefly, it doesn't become a lapse, it becomes a relapse and it just, you know, there's cognitions around, I fall off the wagon, there's no point now, it's all over, I might as well go and have a good time and off they go, is the risk with that model. And the risk with the harm reduction model is that it doesn't take substances off the table. Right. So how do you judge, you know, what is or isn't okay at varying points? So dialectical abstinence is, we start with the concept of abstinence, right? So just don't do it. Um, however, if there's a slip, then we flick into the harm reduction and then we flick back to abstinence. So it's this flick between the two things. Um, in our, one of our um, group skill rules is don't come to therapy um, influenced by substances. And the next rule is, if you do, pretend you're not. Right. Yeah, all right, dialectics, it's great. I get to contradict myself as much as I like, and I just say, it's a dialectic. All right, so what that's about is you've got two mutually exclusive goals, all right? The first one is you don't want them using substances, and also if they're under the influence of substances, the degree to which they can benefit is impaired anyway. And you want them coming to skills come hell or high water, right? No matter what's going on, you want them in skills group because they are never going to get any skills if they're not there. And even if they're under the influence of something, who knows, they might pick something up. And at least it's creating that habit of attendance. So, <clears throat> you know, the balance of those is don't do it. If you do do it, pretend you don't, right? So the idea at that point in time is you don't want to trigger anybody else in the room. So they've got to actually be able to hold it together to a reasonable degree and not obviously appear affected by substances. Um, there are occasions, if they are, that a therapist will encourage them to exit stage left, but we, um, we try very hard not to do that, actually. Right, so that's dialectical abstinence. This one here, um, what I didn't do earlier in the mindfulness section was the states of mind. And in states of mind, you talk about reasonable mind, which is very fact logic driven an emotion mind, which is emotions are in charge, they're driving your behavior, they're completely in control of the show and your brain is completely switched off. And wise mind is the synthesis of those two things. This actually looks very similar to that. So your addict mind is it's all about the addiction. Basically, if you're in addict mind, then they're using. Clean mind however, is not awesome either because it tends to be naive and risk-taking. So these are the people who, I've stopped using drugs, this is not a problem for me, I'm just, I'm just never going to do it again. Of course I can go to that party with all of my friends who all use drugs. I'll just say no. Okay, people said this to you? Yeah, all right. So that's clean mind. So it's naive, it's risk-taking, it's oblivious to the danger. Um, and so no problem solving happens around those areas because they're not looking at them. Clear mind is acknowledging that you've got a problem with substances, acknowledging that there's an addiction and that you're going to be at high risk in certain situations and what skills can you use, what parameters can you put in place that minimise the risks in those particular circumstances. Sometimes that's changing a complete social group, which can be hard for people because sometimes that's all their social group, so they go from that to isolation, which is a bit tricky. Um, sometimes it's about only staying for an hour or whatever it is. Right. So that's the other one that we talk about. Community reinforcement. <laughs> Pretty sure you guys do that anyway. Um, replace addiction reinforcers with abstinence reinforcers. So, you know, searching for people to spend time with who don't have addiction problems. Increasing pleasant events that don't involve substances. Abstinence sampling, you know, committing to a certain period of time without, um, without using the substance in particular. Burning bridges, building new ones. So sometimes that is about, I can't associate with those people anymore. And that can be quite tricky for people, not only from the isolation perspective, but also um, you know, they feel judgmental and all that kind of stuff. 
So there are, there are conversations that we have about that as well. Telling people that you've quit, right? So that's about accountability, obviously. Building, building new relationships. Urge surfing, do you guys talk about urge surfing? I'm pretty sure you do that, yeah. This one is a bit amusing. So if particularly in cases where the substance abuse is a bit about rebellion, right, that's not the case for all clients with addictions, but in cases where it is find another way to be rebellious is basically what this one is. Do something that's not necessarily particularly socially acceptable, but also isn't going to get you in trouble. Right. Shave your head, diet pink, wear your clothes inside out. It just looks like you've been busy this morning, but anyway, whatever. All right. So be rebellious in a less harmful way is basically what that one is about. Adaptive denial, this one actually is amusing as well. Um, you know, this is, you have to give logic a complete break because it makes no sense whatsoever. So it's when the urge hits, you're denying to yourself that what you actually want is that's, let's go cigarette. What you desperately are craving right now is a lollipop. I don't, I don't want a cigarette, that's not what the craving is. I desperately want a lollipop right now. That's what I want. All right, so I'm gonna go and get a lollipop. All right, so it's adaptive denial. So it's just, it's pretending you want something else. So you have to give logic a complete break. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever otherwise. And the clients look at you as though you're crazy. And you go, yep, do it anyway. Joy of dialectics, yes, I know that's rubbish. Yes, I want you to do it anyway. All right. And then of course, you know, it's putting it off. I only have to stand this for five minutes and then another five, and then another five, and then another five. So that's, that's basically the set of addiction skills that we use. And those are the ones that we use where um, the clients have listed on their diary card that one of their target behaviours is substances. That's what we do with it. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Kate, Sorry, um, for a very informative presentation. Are there any questions in the room? I know you've got, I've got over time, you'll probably need to run away. Oh, we're not worried about that. Uh, we actually <laughs> just said, you know, we had our highest online um, clock in with over 100 people. Oh, great. Um, online to listen. Right. Um, and we do have a couple of questions online. Mm -hmm. One you kind of answered, uh, which is, do clients ever make false statements on their therapy cards or diary cards to try and help guide the therapy session in a certain direction for themselves? Um, yeah, look, sometimes, but to be honest, not often. I mean, it's DBT particularly is a voluntary program. One of our exclusion criteria is that you're on a TA. So if you're if you're forced into treatment, you're not coming to DBT because we actually need the commitment from the client. And what goes on the diary card are the skills that the client wants to work on. So sometimes they might not want to work on, for example, an addiction, and you think that it's really important. So you, you, you work with that, but you don't work with it in the same way. So if, for example, there's been an episode of self-harm and you're going to do a chain on that, and lo and behold, oh, look, there's substances appeared somewhere in that chain. Hmm, that's interesting. By the time you've done that five times and you've pointed the same thing out, sometimes you can get commitment to actually put substances on the diary card. But it's, 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 with, it's something that the client wants to work on. And the second question that we've got online, and while I ask this, can everyone just make sure that they do fill in Kate's registration and evaluation forms Please, um, yeah. before they run out the room? So I know we are getting pushed for time. Um, but somebody's asked that they're very interested in uh, participating in some further DBT training and becoming involved to better support their clients. How would somebody go about doing that? Depends upon where you work. Um, if you work in mental health at the Royal, Go and tell your team manager, and I would love to talk to you about that. You can come and join my team. Um, I do a four-day training package for staff that join the DBT team at the Royal. That's delivered sort of once or twice a year. So I already delivered that once this year. I did it in March. I'm trying very hard to avoid doing it again this year because it's actually an enormous amount of work, but I might have to do it again in September, October anyway. Um, the other mental health services in this district being um, Red Cab and Charlie's, they've got programs. Um, whenever I run training, I tend to donate a couple of spots to those hospitals, so they, I've trained most of their staff as well. Um, if you don't work in that context, um, 
your look there are one hour in services I can do here and there but you know my position is really about supporting staff of this organization it's only a three day a week job um, so a lot of people pay you know so like I do I do work privately as well in my private company um, which is DBT Brisbane plug um, does private training as well. So we've done a lot of training with Footprints, for example. They actually run a skills group, which is actually a pretty good skills group. Um, it's I've actually had a client go on to that group and has benefited that client. So yeah, I can also validate awesome. that Great. as well. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, it's, they're a pretty good crew. Um, uh, it's just that the self-harming population is because it's just a skills group, it's not adherent for that population. But um, they, they do that, but they pay us to come and do their training. Um, and that would probably be the case. Um, or supervision, you know. Um, again, if you, work, if you work within my public system thing, you can talk to me about that. If you don't, then, yeah, I do have, I do have people come and, come and hang out at my clinic on, on Tuesdays, my private practice clinic, and pay for supervision. I'm happy to do small groups if that makes it easier for people. But yeah, it is, it is tricky. Uh, We've had two other questions come through. One is, do you keep the 12 month time frame regardless of the client participation level, or does that vary? It can vary. We try very hard to keep it at the 12 month mark, and somewhere between, I think, about probably 80 and 90% that's the case. Every now and again, if we've got a client who has, say, struggled a lot with dissociation, and we think that they've actually spent half of the program not really present and not really hearing the skills, we might give them another six months. And finally, can you highlight the four keys for discussion in the consult group? The what? The four keys for discussion in consult group. That's the question. I don't understand what that question no, means. I, I'm assuming it's related. The, I'm sure the answers for that were on the slides. Um, I mean, in, in consult group, the main purpose of consult group is therapy adherence. So what happens is we sort of triage the urgency so the therapists talk about how urgently do I need to talk about a client um, and that's um, client getting worse, client at risk of dropping out, I don't know what to do with this client kinds of issues and then um, you know you present like a three minute um, summary of the situation, you ask for whether you want a prom problem analysis, a solution analysis, validation for yourself or validation for the client. It's four of those, maybe that's what they're talking about. Um, yeah. Thank you very much Kate and I'd like to sort of thank Kate today. Thank oh. you.